please turn with me to Acts, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We're going to begin at verse 9, and we're going to go to the end of the chapter. It's really long. It's like two stories that we're going to go through. And so uh, just bear with me as we read through these two stories together. So Acts chapter 8, verse 9 to the end of the chapter reads this. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry. Because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out on his way. He met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candic, which means queen of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. And who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave order to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, remained at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Father, I thank you so much for your church, for establishing your church, for leading your church, for guiding it. And even when we don't know what we are doing. 
and even when we want to remain in our comfort zones. I thank you, Father, that you carry out your blessing for us. You bring situations and circumstances into our lives to help shake us up a little bit, to help us understand and to really find insight into thinking that the foundation that we thought that we are standing on that is secure may not be as secure as we hoped it to be. And I thank you, Father, that you did that for the early church as well, too. And I thank you, Father, through their example that we can learn in today's time in our own setting how we are called, Father, to follow you. I thank you, Father. May you bless us with insight. May you bless us with wisdom. May you bless us, Father, with an open heart that we may receive your gospel and to live it out. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a question that comes at the end of this passage that's an important one and kind of frames the whole um, uh, sermon for today. And it's this. When the Ethiopian came upon some water and then after hearing this, uh, this uh, good news that was explained to him by Philip in helping him understand what the prophet Isaiah was saying because even for this guy who lived near to the time of, uh, of Isaiah than we did, he too had difficulty understanding what is this all about? What does this all mean? We know that this eunuch himself, he went to Jerusalem, this uh, Ethiopian eunuch, he went to Jerusalem to, and the Bible says, to worship. There's this lure that he had towards this church or towards God, towards is there really this God, and can I worship him? Is he deserving of my worship? It interests him because somewhere in his thinking and somewhere in his everyday life, he felt like, I'm not sure if this is all there is to life. So he ends up in Jerusalem because he had probably some political affairs that he had to deal with, with the uh, people there and dealing with his own uh, queen back in Ethiopia and being uh, the treasurer and all this kind of stuff. But he's saying, as long, since I'm in Jerusalem anyways, I might as well try to sit in and see what this church thing, what this God thing, what this Yahweh thing is all about. Yet it doesn't really penetrate in because he still has a lot of questions. As we see as he's traveling back, he has these questions about what is this scroll? Maybe the, the person who was preaching that day was preaching from Isaiah, and he had no understanding of what it was saying, no understanding of what it meant. And then after having it explained, he makes this great phrase. What can now stand in my way? Of being baptized what can now stand in my way of being baptized I get it not only do I get it he says I want it nothing will stand in my way now brothers and sisters there's a lot of us here uh, whether we've been in church for a long time whether this is our first time ever stepping into a church but usually that question is always at the back of our minds is what really stands in our way or what are the influences that stand in our way of being baptized, of coming to follow Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord, coming to the place where we're able to acknowledge him, you really are God. And because you are the most important thing on earth, in fact, in all of this universe, you must take the first priority of everything that I do in my life. Now, what stands in our way? And what is the barrier that is there that keeps us from really discovering who this God really is? Well, we see some hints of this in the first story that we read from Simon the Sorcerer. When we look at his life, we see that in Samaria, remember in the beginning of Acts, Jesus said to the disciples, this gospel will be spread first in your hometown, and then he says to Samaria, to this neighboring uh, city as well too. And now the gospel has spread into Samaria, but the author, Luke, of Acts is giving some background that before this gospel went in, there already was a spiritist in Samaria. His name was Simon, and he was known as the sorcerer or the great power of of God because he was going around doing a lot of sorcery and a lot of magical things on certain people and people were amazed by him and they're thinking he must be a representative of God 
until the gospel came in. It came in. It was so much more powerful. There was so much more integrity. There was so much more weight to the words of what was being presented that a lot of people began to turn from Simon the sorcerer and turn towards his gospel. In fact, it was so powerful. And the words and what the gospel had to offer was so attractive that even Simon the sorcerer says, he says, he too believed and was baptized. See, there were some things that was happening with this gospel that made all these barriers that formed in people's lives and their arguments about why I can't follow Christ, why this religious stuff doesn't make sense, all of these things began to fall as they really began to understand what this gospel was. Even Simon the sorcerer, with all of his power, all of his accolades as the sorcerer or the great power of God in his own city, he was willing to lay that aside in order to experience this new gospel. But for Simon the sorcerer, there's still something that stood in his way. And we see what that was. When Simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. See, for Simon... The thing that is in his mind is, even though he believed, and even though he was baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, he still did not change. Now, this is, uh, this is amazing because, you know, when I was younger, I remember when I saw great things happening in the churches around me. Uh, there are sometimes I went to these revival services and, and a special speaker who has a certain anointing powers would come and start preaching. And then suddenly people beside me would be falling or some people would be trembling. And I always wondered in the midst of this atmosphere, what is going on and, and what is happening to them? What are they experiencing that it seems so alluring? Or why can't I have some of that too to convince me that God really is real? So even though I was going out to church all the time, I wanted some of that experience in my life, but I'm not getting it. And I always wonder, what does that feel like? Because if I had something like that, I too would have all doubt erased in my mind, and I would know God to really be God. In this situation here, the same thing was happening. Earlier, a few chapters before, we see the church doing these great things and people compelled to sell their property and share what they have in common because they can't stand seeing another brother or sister in Christ suffering in materialism when they have enough for themselves. And then all these miracles are happening, people are being healed, people are being touched by the Spirit, and as these miracles are taking place, Simon the sorcerer, he's watching all these things happen, and he's wondering, but why am I left out? Why am I left out? He looks throughout the crowds, and he sees everyone touched. He sees everyone changing, everyone transforming. But for him, he's wondering, but why am I left out? I want that same power too. I want to experience that same miracle, that same signs, those same wonders. I want that in my life. And that's exactly what he asks Peter for. Hey, you know what? I'll give you some money. If I give you some, can you teach me? Teach me how to do that. So that in my life, in my mind, I can do the same thing as well too. And I can feel this power of God inside of me being, uh, being able to bless other people as well too. I want that same power. See, what we find out in Simon the Sorcerer is that he actually never changed. He actually never changed. To believe in the name of Jesus is very different, as we see later on in the passage, to believe in the name of Jesus is very different 
than approaching him and learning how to repent or learning how to turn away from our former ways or our former values. See, this is very key. Believing Jesus as a principle is very different than the first step, the first stage that is needed, which is repentance. See, this is why Peter says in verse 20, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Now here's a solution, he says. Repent. Because that's not what you've done when you first came to make the verbal confession that you believe in Jesus Christ. In fact, that's not what was done when you were baptized. Bapti uh, being baptized is, should have been the outward symbol of what has already taken place in your heart. That in your heart that you recognize there are certain things and certain values that you hold on to that, that put you at center and that put your desires and your um, uh, whatever our sin issues are in our life, it puts that first in our pursuit. And he says, these things you need to lay down because whatever treasure is in your heart, he says, that's what you will ultimately find yourself longing after. And when you receive Jesus Christ, you need to repent of your former treasure because what we're deciding to do is we're saying no to the treasure that we want to fulfill our life, Rather, whether it may be wealth, whether it may be power in the sense of Simon the Sorcerer, whether it may be relationships. We don't know what it may be for you, but we all have something that makes us believe that this will fulfill my life. And that's what the Bible calls the treasure that you keep in your heart. And unless you repent or you lay down that treasure that is usually sought after because of our own, of our own sinful behavior, he says, there's no room for the lordship of Christ. There's no room for the experience of what God brings to our life in us. There's no room. So we too can be exactly like Simon the sorcerer, and we can come and we can say, well, I'll believe. All right, I'll believe in principle that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I will believe to the point where, yes, if you want me to go through membership class and want me to be baptized, sure, I will do all of that. But the fundamental thing that we need to really dig deeper into is simply repentance. But will you repent? See, for Simon, this power aspect was the most important to him. He says, okay, great, I will, swi I will switch over from my understanding of how I was using my magic to, to access these dark arts in order to do these certain signs or certain miracles, I will, I will trade that in if, if I come over to you, you give me the same thing. That was his mindset. There was no laying down. There was no repentance. That's not going to be my pursuit anymore. That was still his treasure. All he's doing is he's now switching his treasure from this area to Jesus and saying, Jesus, now you meet my treasure. You give me what I want. And that is my adherence or my loyalty to you based on my treasure. For some of us, we have the same kind of tendencies. Um, we, we have bad relationships that have formed in the past, and we're sick and tired of the cyclical Bad relationship after bad relationship after bad relationship. But relationship really is, or trying to be fulfilled by relationship, really is the treasure in our heart. And so what we're thinking sometimes is we feel like if I transfer this treasure from this account into Christ's account so that he will give me a good Christian girl or a good Christian guy to fulfill these these relational needs that I have. I will declare Jesus as my Lord, and I will be willing to be baptized. 
But the problem that a lot of us have already experienced in that way is nothing really does satisfy. So we've tr made that transfer over. We've been, we've been part of church community for a long time, and then nothing feels any different. We're still experiencing hardships in our relationship. It's still not going good, and, we're, and we feel like, why is God so silent when I come to church, I'm reading my Bible, I'm praying, and I'm trying to do what God is calling me to do? Because Peter says, you have no part or share in this ministry without repentance. See, brothers and sisters, when we try to make God the fulfiller of a certain treasure that we have, we can never escape that. This is why we feel so unfulfilled in our journey with Christ is because every time we approach God, that's the secret big elephant that's in our, in our hearts, in our minds, whether God will fulfill that or not. And every time he doesn't fulfill it the way that I want it to be fulfilled, what happens is we get disappointed with God and we want to walk away. See, this repentance that Simon the sorcerer needs to do says, turn your back from desiring that, from desiring that power. And just learn how to pursue Christ because he is the ultimate fulfiller of our life. There are aspects of our desires that we have in our life that we don't quite understand what really will satisfy us. And he says, if you, if you follow by just laying this down and just trusting him, taking the moment to just trust him with Whatever you are seeking and just say, okay, I know I really want this, but I'll lay it down for now. And I'll just try to follow and just try to be filled by him. This is what repentance is. And when we learn how to repent, that's when our hearts are emptied and now can be filled with the spirit. See, look at the result that happens when we continually pursue God in this kind of way. In verse 23, he says, For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. What Peter was identifying in, in Simon the Sorcerer, he, he, even though he was in church, he was listening to this, but he's seeing everything that's happened. So he's still seeing people are being transformed. People are being changed from this gospel, and he's watching all of this happening. And as he's watching it, he's still bitter in his life. He's still bitter, and he's captivated by his sin. See, brothers and sisters, this is a great warning that Peter brings into our church as well, too, because he makes us think about whenever we step in into this place or when we look at our, uh, our own relationship with Christ, do we sense bitterness? Is there a bitterness that creeps into our hearts, into our minds, that makes us feel like, I don't know why I'm doing this. I keep going to church. My friends keep telling me to go, my pastor, my leaders, and, and I just keep showing up, but I'm just bitter. And I'm angry. And I'm sick and tired. See, if we have that root of bitterness inside of us. It may not be the community that's causing it. It may not be the church that's causing it. It may actually be what Peter identifies for Simon, your sin. Whatever it is that we hold on to, that we insist